Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country, sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you like our interviews, press like and subscribe. Also leave comments. This, this helps us continue to bring great interviews. Did you ever wonder why fruits and vegetables are colorful? The color in fruits and vegetables provide a variety of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and phytochemicals, and have enormous healing powers. The advice, eat the rainbow, is often used and can be an easy way to get a complete range of carotenoids, which are protective plant pigments your body needs to thrive. Today's guest, Dr. Pinnikin DeVay, OD, PhD, is an expert in ocular nutrition and lectures both nationally and internationally on the health benefits of carotenoids. Dr. DeVay is a full professor at Western University of Health Sciences College of Optometry. He holds Doctor of Optometry degree from Southern College of Optometry and a PhD from Angular Ruskin University in Cambridge, England. He has authored, he has authored over 50 international publications. He is an active researcher focused on retinal physiology and glaucoma. In addition, he's the vice president of OWNS, the Ocular Wellness and Nutrition Society. Welcome, Dr. DeVay. Hello, Gary. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. So, Dr. DeVay, let's get into it. What are carotenoids and why are they so important? So, carotenoids are compounds that uh, are related to carrot, hence the name carotenoids. Um, these compounds are present, as you said, in fruits and vegetables. Um, the green they are, they are, have uh, more carotenoids. The orange, the yellow ones also have a lot of carotenoids. They are uh, useful for various functions in the body and we understand them through the eye, but they're present all over the body and they help us, like for example, skin, brain, heart, stress, kidney level, uh, kidney uh, secretions, etc. as well. Why are the carotenoids or pigments in the plant? What do they do for the plants? Well, in the plants uh, also, we believe that they actually, plants uh, don't have houses. They tend to sit uh, outside in the sun for a long time. And they've learned to synthesize uh, compounds that protects uh, itself. Humans, on the other hand, have lost the ability to synthesize these carotenoids, um, and we have, uh, we have to eat them uh, via our diet to actually obtain these carotenoids that are so important to our bodily functions. There are many studies on the health of the eye, and we're going to get into it later on macular degeneration, for example. And the, be the better somebody absorbs uh, the carotenoids or gets it into their blood, the less the risk of macular degeneration. When they do studies, and they look at the amount of carotenoids or lutein or zeaxanthin in the blood, there's a much greater, lower, there's a much lower risk of getting macular degeneration or cataracts as opposed to when you just eat it. So what affects how well we can absorb uh, uh, these carotenoids? All right, so there are two parts to it that you went in. One, that is the level of carotenoids in the eye. Uh, let's stick to the eye for the moment. And second is the disease process of macular degeneration. So these carotenoids, as one takes in through their diet, um, either green leafy vegetables um, tend to have lutein more, um, bell, uh, orange um, peppers tend to have zeaxanthin more. So these are two terms that you actually uh, might as well get familiar with because we'll be talking about this a lot. These are two carotenoids found in the eyeball and they get deposited in the retina and the crystalline lens, or which is the, um, uh, the focusing uh, lens of your eye. Now, what happens is 
these gets deposited. So clinically as a doctor, you and I can probably look at the eye and have some idea that there is carotenoids present in the retina. You could also quantify this by a test in your clinic and to know sort of what level your carotenoids are in your retina. And now this is very helpful because as you said, that individuals that eat more of these uh, carotenoids um, tend to have lesser risk of macular degeneration in long term. And this has been shown time and again, and now it's also almost ex uh, exclusively acceptable that a good macular pigment is a, a, a good biomarker and decreases the risk for development of this macular degeneration, which is um, an irreversible uh, blindness. So um, uh, to actually strictly say, we know that we eat some and how we eat them is very important because you know these carotenoids are present in the plant product but you know like unlike we actually might think that you know raw is always good that's not the case how our body might absorb it so by cooking them a little bit not too much but by cooking them a little bit with a little bit of fat helps our body um in absorbing it First, by cooking it, we release it from the matrix. So think of this as a matrix that's holding on to the carotenoids. And by cooking it, we just release it enough. And the fat helps it absorb it in our system. So when we cook it, should we, so it's better cooking it than raw, a little bit better. Is it low heat, medium heat, high heat? And how long should we cook it for? And I know it may not be exact, but in your opinion, what do you think is the best way to get it to for somebody to be able to absorb it? I have to admit, my wife is a better uh, person to answer this question than I am. She doesn't let me much in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Jokes apart, um, the reality is uh, you want to actually cook it with actually medium heat, low to medium heat. You want to always cover it. You don't want to expose too much um, of the food item to air either. Uh, and um, uh, that would be the way to go. Uh, the important thing is to also have a decent amount of fat in it. Not excessive, good fats indeed help absorption of these carotenoids. And we know that uh, omega-3 uh, fats uh, enhance the absorption uh, when you have it. So the function of these carotenoids, why they're there, why they're in our blood vessels and in the heart as well. And there's actually been some studies that show people with higher carotenoids have a decreased risk of cancer. But when we talk about the eye, what are the function of that macular pigment as far as free radicals and blue light? How does it work? Why, why do we have it there? In the eye? Yes, in the macula, okay. in the center so, of the eye. So we are actually talking about the eye, but see certain things are actually more complicated. See, the eyeballs don't function alone. There are other bodily uh, hormones, and function that may in fact impact the eye. But we let, let's start with the eye for per se. So sticking to the eye, uh, as optometrists and ophthalmologists, you can, you can understand that um, there are, okay, let, let's start with this. You're exposed to light day in and day out. We are awake, we're exposed to light. Now the amount of light that goes in is not the same as the amount of light that is coming out. So our eyeball has, um, a, uh, a certain amount of absorption that, that occurs, this generates heat, this generates something called free radicals as there is very high metabolism in the eyeball. In fact, it'll be, uh, it's a surprising fact that eye, particularly the retina, is the most metabolically uh, active tissue in the body. And so there is a lot of metabolism. And so this carotenoid um, was initially thought as this yellow pigment spot in the retina as an artifact because we were looking uh, at the eyeball using light. So people thought, ah, that has to be a reflection. But it turned out to be that was not a reflection, that yellow spot in the right in the center, which is the most important for your vision called the macula, particularly the fovea, the yellow spot, is very highly active. And these carotenoids actually um, suppress uh, the oxidant uh, damage that occurs due to this highly metabolic uh, region. So you have oxidative damage. So these antioxidants that are present there sort of suppress the oxidative damage. And that's one way of looking what they do. Second thing is our vision, human vision is developed so well and so precise. We have a central 
region that is of very high importance and that fovea gives us very crisp vision. Now it's interesting to know that the exact mechanism of how this carotenoid helps in our visual processing is uh, not fully understood, but those individuals that have greater amount of carotenoids or macular pigment in the eye, um, they tend to see better. And so uh, one of the one of the hypotheses was that the stray light is absorbed much better and we're able to detect edge. It's not as simple as that because well, there are more complicated processing that goes into it, but the greater amount of macular pigment, the better your vision. Uh, third thing, we are also exposing ourselves to blue light on a more regular basis. Now, this is a new thing. We are talking via Zoom. We are always on our computers. Um, we are, and computers are everywhere. You could wear them as a watch. You could have a phone. You could, you are be, you be seeing uh, monitors. Uh, doctors are seeing monitors. So we are constantly LED lights. All this is blue light. Now, blue light is essential to regulate our body systems. So not all blue light is bad because blue light regulates our sleep processes, but we have excess of it going on and these carotenoids also help there. The sleep and the stress is a bit more complicated and we can dwell into it in detail um, if you'd like. So there are about 500 or so carotenoids in nature. How many do we eat? How much gets into our blood and how many carotenoids actually get into the eye to protect the eye? And what are the Fabulous question. There are about 750 carotenoids in nature and we eat, we have to eat them. They, um, they are coming, that's the only way we get them in our body. And so we, we have to eat them and about 20 or so make it to our bloodstream. Uh, and we have serum analysis data showing what make it into our bloodstream. Now, everything in our body is uh, by the process of blood taking these nutrients to all over regions, you know, your brain, your eye, your heart, your kidneys, everything is receiving nutrition from the blood. So these carotenoids, 20 or so, that's in the bloodstream, um, we find two of them make it into the eyeball, lutein and zeaxanthin. These are two things that make it into the eyeball. Now, as a diet, American diet, we are more predominantly lutein-based. So we get lutein pretty easily uh, in our diet. Uh, most of us understand green leafy vegetables are good. Spinach are common color, um, uh, green leafy vegetables, collard greens, etc. kale. We understand that. That has very high amount of lutein. Now, zeaxanthin is present and in a significant amount in the other side, so orange, peppers, etc. So zeaxanthin also gets through the diet. Now, our eyeball has learned to convert this lutein, which is readily available in a diet, into something else, a zeaxanthin isomer called mesozeaxanthin. So this occurs by a biochemical process in the eye, and uh, this happens naturally uh, in the eyeball. So we have lutein and zeaxanthin coming from the blood to the eyeball, and then lutein is converted to mesozeaxanthin, which is a zeaxanthin isomer in the retina. So the thicker the macular pigment or the more macular pigment that we get from eating carotenoids, the more protective protection we have for that macula. So, Correct. so what will it protect us against? So um, as we were talking, it's going to protect you against macular degeneration. It may, it may get deposited in the uh, lens preventing uh, a certain amount of cataract. This is talking about the eyes only. It also, um, uh, in the eyes, there are certain receptors that uh, manage sleep, uh, and we can come to that in momentarily. So macular degeneration, cataract, there is growing evidence that they might have a role to play in glaucoma. This is a newer area. Uh, retinitis pigmentosa patients uh, benefit from this. Um, from, from, from these carotenoids. Um, so these are a few to actually mention. And you mentioned there's ways that the optometrist can test for these macular pigments. So if you could explain what some of the commercially available instruments where as a patient is watching this and they want to get their macular pigment, what's the name of the test and should they get their macular pigment tested? So there are a couple of these uh, devices 
that are available in the market. Um, uh, they are actually um, uh, flicker tests. They use a flicker between um, two lights that changes its amount of, uh, amount of intensity and it's observed as a patient as a flicker. They are known, if you want to uh, say a name, they could be Quantify, which is one of the devices. And the uh, other device, which was newly released, is called MapCat SF. Now, these devices are pretty small uh, clinical devices, uh, tabletop devices, that a patient can look into. And the greater, as you said, the greater the amount of density of this macular pigment, the better is the protection offered against these eye diseases. And there are numerous of those that may actually be there. Uh, diabetes, for example, or diabetic eye disease also benefits from this. So what the patient does is patient is asked to look at a light and click a button every time they see a flicker. Now this continues for about a couple of minutes until they can't see a flicker, which is the lowest point. So our eyeball absorbs the blue light. It does not absorb the green light. So the greater the ma macular pigment, more blue light is absorbed and you see the flicker for a longer duration. And then finally what happens is you have uh, an uptick and so this two minute uh, to three minute test is a clinical test that tells you the amount of macular pigment present. Now the key part of this is you wouldn't treat somebody without doing blood work. Let's say for example, Carrie, you have a patient with diabetes, you would get their blood work done before you give them medications for diabetes. Similarly, what optometrists would do is an optometrist can measure the macular pigment, get a baseline, and then give appropriate uh, therapy or advice to the patient and see this change over time to build this pigment up because it's one of the, one of the alterable risk factors. So there are various risk factors, age, ethnicity, uh, race, et cetera, those things come into play. Um, but one modifiable risk factor is macular pigment. The greater the pigment, the lesser are your chances of AMD and certain diseases. So this is a modifiable risk factor that a doctor can actually measure in office and monitor how it changes with time. Now we're gonna recommend that the pigment is low, certain foods that you've mentioned already, spinach, kale, collard greens, brazea, xanthan, uh, yellow, orange peppers, goji berries, things that contain a lot of uh, zea, xanthan as well. But if someone is gonna take a supplement, I know this is the magic question, do we know what the proper dose of the amount of, of carotenoids, of lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin that somebody should take? Or we still don't, we still aren't there, but you have a, uh, from experience, you have a feeling of what you think or a suggestion of maybe what the dosage should be. So this is a, the holy grail question, right? What's the magic pill that can, that can take care of our um, certain lacking diet? Now, let, let's start this in uh, a two-pronged question. Firstly, any disease, um, there is no one-size-fits-all policy. And as you know, do as, a, as, a, as a doctor, we can't use one-size-fits-all policy that works for everyone. But we have some guidelines as to what an individual should do. So, um, and of course, so depending on the disease, the amount of macular pigment present could get lowered due to the disease process. The fact that it's lower may, and ha, may increase the risk for the disease process as well. So there is no one number that can fit everyone. Second thing is that we assumptions are always wrong. For example, as a Caucasian white male, um, we would say, all right, an individual like you could be at a greater risk for macular degeneration. Somebody with pigment like me is, a less, is at a lesser risk of macular degeneration. However, these assumptions could be fundamentally flawed. The Caucasian male or Caucasian female may actually have a better diet and hence have a better macular pigment present in the eye when compared to somebody with a lesser risk to begin with, but may have had a poorer diet, uh, just not the right kind of uh, food substances, maybe cooked very highly or processed very highly. So these assumptions are fundamentally wrong. One needs to look at um, when they arrive in a clinic or into themselves and say, do you th uh, are their diet appropriate? If the diet is not appropriate, first, starting with a good multivitamin is always a great idea because it's not only about carotenoids uh, in, in the eye. 
It's about general health and well-being as well. So a good multivitamin supplement is the foundation or a backbone. On top of that, if you're worried about your eye health, you need to add lutein and zeaxanthin in its amount. As I said, lutein is present far more commonly in our diet. We easily access it. Zeaxanthin, we get less. So um, one uh, small quick uh, thing, because I don't want to go off on a tangent, the amount of lutein and zeaxanthin present in the retina is not the same. So we get more lutein in our diet. However, in the macula, there is, in the centralmost region, right, there is almost uh, 2.5 times of zeaxanthin compared to one part of lutein. So by design or by demand in our body, our body requires more zeaxanthin in the central region, which is the most important for our vision. So and does that include mesozeaxanthin? Yes. So the mesozeaxanthin, we are not able, so zeaxanthin isomer, if you would like to say. Zeaxanthin isomers are far more common in the central region and uh, of, the, of the fovea. Now, so I went through a long process saying we get more in our diet, we require more of zeaxanthin that we get sort of less in our diet. Mesozeaxanthin is only converted into, in, in the eye. So if you had to take a supplement, you want around the ratio to fit two parts of zeaxanthin uh, isomers and uh, or 2.5 parts of zeaxanthin isomers and or zeaxanthin and about one part of lutein in your diet so this ratio is a good idea to sort of maintain i would say uh, if it was my my body i would take um that uh, so 10 milligram and i let's say, assume i don't have macular degeneration i might start with a, a 10 milligram of uh, zeaxanthin and about half that of lutein for general health and how about melanin? How is melanin protective? You know, when you say people of color, they have more melanin. It, they have less macular degeneration. So uh, it, is it protective, the melanin that people have? So we don't know what actually fundamentally protects the people of color pigment uh, in macular degeneration. The interesting uh, fact is, that uh, we, we, we actually just don't understand it completely enough. That's why it's a broad stroking association. We don't know what is protecting them. So um, at the moment, all I can tell you is if you belong to an ethnicity or group of people that have um, greater skin pigmentation, you have a lesser chance of macular degeneration. How and if, is it, if it's really melanin or greater retinal pigment epithelium, uh, pigment, um, I, I cannot comment. So using macular pigment as a biomarker for disease, let's run through the different diseases. Let's start with macular degeneration. What is macular degeneration? All right. So macular degeneration is a, is a continuum or a, um, a, a, a long uh, stretch of disease. You could have an early macular degeneration, a patient that has early macular degeneration. Uh, let, let's start with the classification. That's probably the best way to start. Now, it's easy to bow tie this classification neatly into a dry kind of macular degeneration versus wet kind of macular degeneration. Dry kind of macular degeneration is the most common macular degeneration. 85% of macular degeneration is dry macular degeneration. The wet macular degeneration is about 15%. The wet macular degeneration gets all the attention because if a person has wet macular degeneration, they have a sudden drop in vision. There are new blood vessels growing, which requires to be suppressed. And so it gets the lot, a, big, a, a lot of attention. Whereas the dry macular degeneration, which is the greater amount uh, in the entire population, 85%, um, tend to have a bit more stable with the kind of testing that we do in the clinic. The vision is more stable. We usually check vision with black letters on white background. And, uh, you know, we look around, uh, Kerry, and we don't see um, people walking with black clothes and white clothes. You know, we have different colors and different shades of black and white. So our vision is not necessarily represented by the chart, which has been used in clinic all the time. So now when you have, a, when you have dry macular degeneration, you don't see a damage by these traditional testing strategies that one has been trained in or utilized more commonly. 
if you use contrast sensitivity, identifying dull shades of gray on, um, uh, on a lighter background makes it very difficult to identify. And those are the things that actually simulate nighttime vision, uh, dim light vision, uh, driving conditions, et cetera. So what we find is early macular degeneration, our vision is relatively stable with standard techniques. Uh, we have these drusen, these are yellow spots that actually uh, start forming in the retina that a doctor can see. You can count them. And the more they are in the center and the more pigment damage uh, that is seen in the right in the center region uh, of the eye, that would be in the category of early macular degeneration. As the disease progresses, you get into intermediate stages where there's loss of vision, you see certain regions not so well, lines could be wavy, et cetera. And as the disease progresses, finally in advanced stages, eventually lands up into wet macular degeneration. Um, so this is a sort of a continuum, as I was trying to say, it's a big spread. You wanna hold this, uh, if possible, even before this condition arrives, hence preventative medicine. But uh, once into that, you should try and protect what remains and which would require all these uh, things that we've been talking about. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Thank you for tuning in to the Open Your Eyes podcast. If you like the video you're watching, please hit the like button. Also hit subscribe for weekly new episodes of the podcast along with pod winks and bonus content. All right, let's get back to the show. Professor Deve, what you've done lots of research on technology that involves glaucoma and macular degeneration. Can you speak about the best technology to help us diagnose early macular degeneration so we could recommend or the patient could get recommendations for proper diet, uh, lifestyle, and supplementation? So uh, thank you for that question. That's um, firstly, a good doctor is the key foundation to any technology. So technologies are to assist the doctor. A good doctor that you trust is the way to go. Consistently going to the same doctor allows you to have continuity, continuity of care. So I think that the most important part of an eye exam is the doctor. Secondly, there are devices that my lab has researched at Western University of Health Sciences. We've done many FDA 510K trials on devices, particularly uh, a common device that is present all over is called OCT or optical coherence tomography. We have worked on various generation of OCTs and imaging technology, um, OptiView's iView, OptiView's AngioView. Uh, we have worked on Topcon Maestro OCT, Topcon OCT2000, and so on. And so there's a long list. Uh, and of course, more recently, uh, devices that I cannot really reveal uh, that have been released in Europe, not yet uh, in America, but uh, it is soon to follow. So there are so many of these devices. And if I had to pick one, a good doctor, with a good eye exam, along with an OCT, can definitely uh, stage your level of damage present, as well as um, um, you can actually objectively monitor the disease uh, condition. So OCT along with a good eye exam. As far as exercise and lifestyle, uh, besides the carotenoids to help us decrease the risk, Talk about exercise decreasing the risk of macular degeneration. So <clears throat> a, a good health is fundamental in improving overall all body processes. But in macular degeneration, there might be a couple of ways that exercise may be helping. Now, be careful. I am not recommending um, start running a marathon or join a 100-mile club every that you run 10 miles a day. Uh, but what I'm saying is, good physical fitness actually helps our entire body and it is also seemed to be helping the eyeball. The amount of exercise that you need is uh, the usual recommendation. Uh, and so long as you are not too sedentary, it certainly helps your macular degeneration. This could be a multi-fold uh, method of how it's helping. But if you stick to carotenoids, what happens to carotenoids? You, if a person's eating a good diet, or let's say they're taking a tablet, they're supplementing, if they are sedentary, the carotenoids gets actually deposited in the fat uh, region, the fat of your body, and is, is not available for your organs that require these. 
the eye, the brain, the heart, blood vessels, kidney, etc. So um, you, by actually exercising, decreasing the amount of uh, excessive fat intake, as well as decreasing the fat content, may be helping releasing these carotenoids into the body that may be helping your AMD. So that's one way to explain it. But this is too simplistic, and the answer is probably far more complicated than I have articulated. Retinitis pigmentosa, there's been some recent studies that show that nutrition may be able to slow it down a little bit. If you could explain what retinitis pigmentosa is and what the study has shown us as far as slowing down the progression of that terrible disease. So retinitis pigmentosa is a uh, genetic disease that individuals had developed uh, difficulty in their night vision as a starting step. And as the disease progresses, a central small region in the center is actually all that is left. And even that actually declines over as time increases. So if a person has retinitis pigmentosa, for years we have known that vitamin A therapy actually helps to some extent. But vitamin A therapy, this is a large dose of vitamin A therapy that's usually given to the patient. They also give omega-3 um, oils, uh, fish oil supplements, along with this large dose of vitamin A therapy. What has been shown in a randomized controlled trial, and for the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, what we understand is that um, the lutein that is present in the retina. Now, I need to explain to the, the region of deposit. So if you look at the central region of your eye, there is greater amount of zeaxanthin isomers compared to, uh, to lutein. In the periphery, or if you consider lutein, lutein is sort of evenly spread in the retina at a lesser amount. So in the mid-periphery, where the retinitis, retinitis pigmentosa shows its early damage, if you actually have greater amount of lutein, can it be protective, was the question. And what they found, that keeping the conventional therapy, vitamin A and omega, adding lutein to it, about uh, 10 milligram to 15 milligram of lutein additional to it, prevented visual field loss in the mid periphery, which I think is spectacular finding because we don't have a cure for this disease. However, retinitis pigmentosa might be one of those first things that might actually find cure from stem cell therapy, um, et cetera. Um, and that is coming. But until then, one should consider increasing the lutein intake. Do you remember from the study what uh, the dosage of the vitamin A was that they used? Yeah, it's about in the 15,000 international units. So let's talk. But, uh, but, but, but uh, Kerry, I'd like to say, patients, if you're listening to this, uh, or if you have somebody that has it, um, don't change your dose based on, on the basis of this. Always stick to your doctor's recommendation. They know the best. Let's turn our attention to glaucoma, something that you've done tremendous amount of research on, one of your passions. How is macular pigment related with glaucoma? And this is a new area of study. What are we finding? So <clears throat> it is very interesting that uh, something so obvious, we have not connected the dots but the verdict is not fully out there. So let's start with saying that glaucoma is also, it's, a, it's one of the leading causes of um, irreversible blindness, meaning you can't reverse the damage that has occurred. It is a big, big problem in developed countries like US. It is also um, a big problem in, other, in, in, in the rest of the world where it either dominates as either the number two disease or, or blinding disease in the world. Now, most of the time, uh, patients with glaucoma uh, are treated with uh, pressure-lowering medication, and it keeps the glaucoma at bay. Some individuals still progress despite best cure and uh, best sort of, sorry, best sort of treatment, not cure. There is no cure for this disease that we have actually identified. So glaucoma is a blinding disease. Now, interesting thing is, just like macular degeneration, glaucoma has some level of oxidative damage and the same pathway that kills the cells in your retina, just like macular degeneration. So in, in macular degeneration, you find the photoreceptors uh, actually dying, macula, uh, and uh, what you find in glaucoma is that the ganglion cell axons die, die 
which leads to eventually the loss of cells as well, the photoreceptors as well. So glaucoma may have some commonality. We're not saying it has the same pathogenesis, but some commonality. And it was, uh, there are studies that are showing that patients with glaucoma have decreased macular pigment. And some studies have challenged the finding that this may not be the case. So is it or is it not? It's a very complicated question to answer. The current therapy does not involve carotenoids. Nutrition does not actually um, play a role in the therapy, in, in the treatment of glaucoma. But when you have such a complicated question, you can only answer with extreme control and proper study or experimentation. So I'm a vegetarian. I don't kill animals uh, for food. Um, not just it is innate in me. But certain studies are needed. Well, certain animal studies or control studies are needed. And I worked with uh, some of my colleagues at Western University of Health Sciences that looked at this question particularly. Can we improve the vision in the animal by giving them carotenoids? Secondary, if the animal develop glaucoma, do they have a more protective retina where they can actually tolerate the damage due to glaucoma a little bit better? Those were the two questions. Um, we uh, used a mouse model and the mouse was uh, given, so mouse does not see so well. You know, they are nocturnal creatures. They don't see so well, uh, first point. So the mouse was actually given a zeaxanthin, uh, particularly. Uh, we haven't tried this with lutein or other carotenoids. We gave them zeaxanthin right in the eye. Now, the interesting fact is mouse does not, mouse retina does not have zeaxanthin. Uh, because it actually has an enzyme that breaks down carotenoids. So when zeaxanthin was given to the mouse eye or injected in the mouse eye, in about three days, you saw a beautiful increase in the mouse vision. And how do you measure vision in mouse? Mouse does not say A, B, or doesn't read the chart. So you actually uh, stabilize the mouse and you run a, a target pattern of lines in front of the eye. And when, the, when you have black and white lines moving in front of your eye, or when something moves, you know, our immediate reaction is to look at it. So if you can see it, then you can actually, you will actually be able to look at those lines. So that we measure the vision in the mouse eye, and it's nicely improved. And about day seven, the vision goes away because there's enzyme to break it down. So what we did was uh, we injected in the eye. On day three, we created a high pressure in the eyeball in the mouse eye for about one hour. Now this in humans is like an acute angle closure attack. It's a very painful blinding uh, part of glaucoma. So if a person has acute angle closure, it hurts their eye a lot, there's so much pain and they lose vision very rapidly. So in the mouse, the pressure was increased uh, to very high amounts, 110 millimeters of mercury, which is very similar to acute angle closure attack. And what we found is the retinal ganglion cell axons that had zeaxanthin, the greater the amount of zeaxanthin present helped the mouse to tolerate this damage much better and the ganglions and axons did not die as much, suggesting that these nutrition can have a real role to play in uh, perhaps a treatment of glaucoma in future. Now, God forbid you had glaucoma, would you take zeaxanthin and how much would you take? I'm, I'm hoping nobody gets glaucoma, and my hope is that researchers like myself will perhaps work towards cure of it. But if I had glaucoma or a family member had glaucoma, I would, I still, I, I personally take zeaxanthin myself every day, and um, I would take a large dose. I would take at least um, uh, 20 milligram on a regular basis, and um, that would be my dose to start with. Although there's no one size fits all. If I have glaucoma, I would want a larger dose that can counteract some of the damage. Although fully understanding that this is not a proven therapy, it's going to help my retina overall. It's also going to help my glaucoma to some extent, possibly. Now, there's been some studies that have been done because it's like the Wild West when it comes to supplements and vitamins. And some supplements are in the bottle, what they say is on the bottle, and some have zero the amount what's on the bottle. I know uh, John Nolan did a study and he found that certain supplements were much, much better, like 
the ones that typically a lot of, I know they, a lot of the optometrists use like the one from Zeovision or Macia Health. Uh, but is there anything that we can look at on the label? Is there a regulatory uh, uh, agency that could reg that regulates supplements that we know that this is a quality supplement when we're buying it? What should we look for? So you are quite right. Vitamins have enjoyed the wild, wild west kind of thing. Anybody said anything, and because they're not governed or regulated by FDA, uh, there is a real question. And most of us, even as a as a uh, in, as a private citizen, forgetting that I'm an eye doctor, I look at these supplements, and you get them in the in the supermarket. There's no control on what you can take and what you can buy. You can overdose all you want, and there could be real real problems. So, what do you trust? So, trust your doctor first. First point: if your doctor is recommending, they probably know the best. But is there a a third party objective? certification that we can we can demand on the vitamin that can tell you exactly what is present in the label is what is present one of that um actually the only one one that i know of is uh, nsf certification now nsf certification um is a third party certification that even our um our sports teams have approved so all the uh, baseball teams etc are, are approving of that. So even athletes that are under strict control that they can't take any art substance without being tested and no harm should be there, the NSF certification is accepted. So uh, look for NSF certification on your vitamins um, and that would be my judge of what is considered to be good vitamins. That brings up a great point. I'm very, very interested in visual function, sports. I have a 10 year old who plays baseball and I make sure that his macular pigment is very high and he's taking his omegas and you know, it really helps his hitting. I, I, it really makes a huge difference based on Dr. Stringham's, who was a, uh, who's been a guest on this, on our program. Let's talk about the carotenoids and visual function. Let's first start with screen time. Does low carotenoids, low macular pigment, having low pigment in the macula affects screen time? Does it give us more symptoms? So uh, again, uh, I'm actually glad that you said uh, Dr. Stringham was um, uh, a host. Uh, I presume that's James Stringham that you're talking about. Yes, he was a guest okay. on our program. So uh, uh, James Stringham and Nicole Stringham have done, in my opinion, the pivotal work in looking at how carotenoid could actually uh, help uh, the uh, screen time related, uh, decreasing the screen time related damage. Nicole points out very elegantly in her paper, um, Dr. Nicole Stringham showed that you can take carotenoid and you can change various stress related and your uh, fatigue related to excessive screen time. Now, the problem is we are all at excessive screen time these days. You know, if you look at the amount of screen time that is considered to be excessive, about six hours a day is considered to be excessive. Now, most of us probably shoot that, we actually are probably double the amount of that on every single day. So what happens is, the easy understanding would be that macular pigment, you have greater carotenoids, they absorb the blue light, they actually help in that fashion. But that's too simplistic and it's probably not the real mechanism how we actually have a screen time related or Zoom fatigue that we actually kind of know these days or sort of looking at webinars. Um, they could happen to all webinars, not just Zoom. So what is it about carotenoids? Well, the carotenoids, they don't just help the eye, they get deposited in various parts of the body. So the ones that are, if you remember in the beginning, we talked about there are 20 or so carotenoids in our bloodstream, they get deposited in the brain, as well as certain glands in our body. Adrenal glands have a very high deposit of carotenoids. And adrenal glands control the stress hormone cortisol that is released in our body. So by having good amount of carotenoids in your eye, that might be helping your visual function. It also helps processing of, of, of data. Our eye and our brain can actually respond better if you have greater amount of carotenoids. Subsequently, when you go back into the eye and into the, sorry, behind the eye and to the, towards the brain, these carotenoids are playing a role in actually having better environment. So overall antioxidant capacity is better if you have greater carotenoids in your bloodstream and the stress level can be lower. 
So if you uh, are a, an excessive screen time user, you should definitely, uh, Nicole Stringham's work is beautiful, elegant on this area. I have some early basic science work um, that uh, I can share as well, but Nicole's work is so elegant and she's shown so systematically that if you, get, you take carotenoids, about uh, uh, 12 to 24 milligram of carotenoids, macular carotenoids, you can decrease the screen time related issues a lot. And this is shown systematically in their experiments. There's a decrease the headache, the eye strain, even improved sleep, really amazing. Exactly, it decreases your eye related fatigue, your headache, your general, general feeling of fatigue in the body. And uh, yeah, sleep as well. Patients actually reported, sorry, subjects, these are an experiment, subjects reported these are healthy individuals that reported better sleep due to taking these macular carotenoids. And it's amazing because people that are very sensitive to light, we call that photophobia, or have trouble going from a dark room and adapting to a light room or glare. How does increasing the macular pigment, does it help that or how does it help that? So glare function is, uh, is certainly affected by the amount of macular pigment. You've always noticed that some individuals perform better in bright light, and some people quickly change from uh, dark to bright. They can actually change pretty well. And all these are to a great extent related to the amount of carotenoids present in the eye. If you have, and as I said, the carotenoids major function is to also absorb the stray light, making our vision better. So individuals that have better macular pigment tend to perform better at these stressful environments. An example of a stressful environment as you drive tonight, remember that if you are actually able to tolerate the glare from the amazingly bright um, uh, halogen uh, or uh, lights that are in the car, um, then you will have probably have better levels of carotenoids present in the eye. Dr. Lisa Renzi, who was also on this program, talks about how the macular pigment can be a biomarker to cognition. If you could explain a little bit about that. So Dr. Lisa Renzi Hammond has done, and uh, uh, Billy uh, Hammond, have done pivotal work in the neural processing. Um, it is a very complicated area, but what they showed in a very systematic fashion in multiple different experiments, and they went by looking at various um, age groups. So if you look at older age groups, um, seven, uh, in terms of around mean age of 75 or so. What they found is that individuals, and actually, let, let's not forget your video on Open Your Eyes uh, interviewed all these uh, uh, older individuals uh, close to 100 years of age and what made them special. So we'll come to that momentarily. But Dr. Lisa Renzi Hammond and uh, Billy Hammond has done pivotal work on this area. What they showed is that the older age group, they, if they are given um, even a certain amount of carotenoids. Uh, now we're talking not very high dose, even a little bit. What they found is that they found great benefits in their executive function. Their task completion rate was much better. Their overall neural processing was better. She subsequently went ahead with a younger age group and also showed the same findings that people actually uh, just performed better in these very activities, even when they were younger when they were given carotenoids. And then Billy uh, Hammond, and I think Dr. Lisa Renzi Hammond also on the same paper, they showed that um, individuals that are sports athletes, their uh, reaction time and their processing speed is faster if they have greater amount of carotenoids present uh, in their eye. Now, uh, there are multiple ways of examining this, you, but the easiest way to examine your brain carotenoid uh, in your brain is not actually taking a sample from the brain because we can't do that. We can't have a biopsy of our brain, but you can measure your eye carotenoids and they're very highly correlated to the brain carotenoids. So um, if you have to know that, are you processing the data really fast enough? Um, or are you, are you able to take care of, you know, Kerry, you've been a baseball player. You know, why can you hit the ball so well and not somebody else? Um, and that comes down to, uh, some of these fundamental processing speeds that are altered by the levels of carotenoids. You brought up the centenarians. What's the difference between the amount of uh, carotenoids in their macula or the macular pigment from an infant 
as people become a centenarian? So some of this is probably in the stages of hypothesis, you know, just because you see some amount to be less doesn't mean causality. So keep that fundamentally in mind. So we can have associations does not tell you that that's the cause of the disease or the problem. It is very interesting that we find that during developmental years, early developmental years, we find that the, um, uh, the brain has a very high amount of carotenoids. And the answer is that we all think it is that the brain is still in developing stages, so it requires these uh, enormous amount of carotenoids to be present in the brain. And if you remember, we study much better when we are younger. We do things really well when we are younger. Now, Dr. Khan and associates have shown in systematic um, uh, fashion what they've shown that kids, children that actually have greater amount of macular carotenoids, even after accounting for certain differences like IQ levels, et cetera, perform better in mathematics and reading tasks, et cetera, due to, um, and this is very, very much correlated to the presence of carotenoids in the eye. Now you might say, how does the eye carotenoids help you become a good mathematician? Well, it's not really the eye carotenoids, it's the eye carotenoids correlation to brain carotenoids that sort of helps in that fashion. Now you fast track and go into older age group where we find all these age-related diseases um, throw out their ugly heads. These age-related diseases don't seem to be actually, they're not actually forming when you're old. This has been ongoing by in your life. And so um, one hypothesis or one association what is found is that the brain carotenoids are much lesser as we grow older and we don't perform as well as when we were young. So can it be associated with actually decreased function, perhaps even certain age-related diseases like Alzheimer's? And you were talking about Dr. Nolan's work, uh, phenomenal in that area. He's shown that Alzheimer's and certain age-related diseases also benefit from these carotenoids. And so the answer would be that what we were in health when we were young, we needed a lot of it. We had a lot helped us. And as we grow older, it's becoming lesser. So we need to take care of ourselves during those years to actually have better old age and better processing speed. Just fascinating information about carotenoids and children learning. I mean, that's really groundbreaking information and groundbreaking research. You know, it's, it's really a shame because the average study that researchers like yourself, Dr. Renzi, Dr. Hammond, the average study takes about 17 years between, by the time the clinician uses what's happening in research. I mean, there's about 2.5 million studies and research studies that are done every year. So it's very difficult maybe to get that information to the doctors, but from a philosophical point of view, how could we, how could we shorten that span from the great work you're doing from 17 years down to one or two or three years? So there has been leaps and bounds of uh, progress in that area. So if you look at not so long ago, during my PhD years, um, I had to send a manuscript via FedEx to actually get to a journal. It took about a six months time before you had revisions that came back, back and forth. It was six month acceptance uh, time was usual, which it took about a year to get published. And then that was research, that was cutting edge. It took about a year to get it published. And then what was in the research world didn't always translate into the clinical world because of lack of communication. The, in recent years, things have actually become a lot faster. Publications are a lot faster. They are open access. And I'm a huge fan of open access because we shouldn't bind the research saying that only if you had a subscription to a particular journal, you can read it. Open access allows you anybody in the world, including patients to actually go to the PubMed and download an article and read it. And so that has helped a lot. I think um, certain podcasts and certain uh, delivery systems that we are using right now, just like the one that we're talking about, has enhanced uh, information transfer from research to clinic faster. And I think um, more of that is what would actually really help in fast tracking this. Second thing would actually help is that our bar for um, requirement, our bar for information to be perfect 
and to be tested again is pretty high, which requires money. So for example, let's say if Dr. Khan's work, um, pivotal, groundbreaking, uh, astounding as it is, somebody has to repeat it and somebody else has to confirm it the third time or the fourth time before clinicians are going to jump on it and say, well, this, is, this is going to become standard of care. So we need more research funding for this, re this kind of work to happen. And this might be federal, this might be state, this might be philanthropic or industry funding. All this is needed to shorten that 17 year. And you're very conservative in saying, it really does take a much longer sometimes uh, for research to translate into clinic. Dr. DeVay, thank you for that, that answer. You mentioned sleep before. Talk to me about sleep and how that's all related with the eye and carotenoids and making of melatonin. Talk about that a little bit. So we, again, there is hypothesis. We don't know the exact true reasons for why our sleep is disrupted completely, but we understand to some extent. I wear multiple trackers on my wrist because I'm doing certain elemental or fundamental uh, work. I sleep with Apple Watch on my right and Fitbit on the left because I want to try to compare and seeing that are these commercially available trackers able to tell me enough about my sleep along with my diet that's going to change. So fundamentally, there are certain cells, uh, intrinsic photosensitive ganglion cells, fancy word to say these actually uh, regulate your sleep process. Um, so if you are not having a good amount of exposure to daylight, or if you have excessive exposure to light during just before sleepy hours, our body is going to be in disarray. So if you, most of us don't spend enough time outside in the sun and that is needed, you need certain amount of exposure to the sun that makes us wake up in the morning. And towards the tail end uh, of the day, you wanna decrease the amount of light if possible, and particularly shy away from computer work, iPad, iPhones. Most of us actually sleep with our iPads, reading before, and this messes up our, our sleep cycle. Why it does that? It could be the blue light in part, but there are multiple reasons why this could be happening. And the hormone melatonin, which is supposed to be upregulated or increased uh, in the body that puts us to sleep, tends to actually not get increased if you have iPad or even an iPhone. Um, actually, I, I should not just say iPad. Any tablet computer or any phone, uh, smartphone, if you use during uh, just before sleep can disrupt this cycle. And uh, what uh, Dr. Nicole Stringham's work showed is that this having greater carotenoids in your diet or by giving it as a supplement uh, can change this uh, vicious cycle. I think a lot of people don't realize that melatonin, even though it comes out at night, it's actually made in the morning when you go outside. So it's so important that people get some sunlight in the morning. So I know for me, when I can't get sunlight, I'll actually drive with the sunroof down because uh, light is nonlinear. So you could get a combination of the blue light, the infrared light, and depending on the latitude, UV, and you get the right combination that we're supposed to, so we could actually make our own melatonin, so when we need it at night. And as you said, light at night could be a big problem. The Allen, the artificial light at night, is something that we need to avoid. Otherwise, it will, we're staring at that, that, that digital device could really uh, negatively affect our sleep. That's correct. So the only, only difference I would like to say is, uh, it doesn't, it's not formed in the morning because these are short acting uh, hormones. They're really just formed at the nighttime. But what it does is you want the peak and trough to be present, right? So you want the trough, you want it to be suppressed and you want to wake up in the morning. So by exposing yourself to light, you are suppressing that cycle and, uh, and having, that in, having that push in the morning of having exposure to light wakes you up. And this gets you into a day night uh, in a diurnal rhythm of melatonin production. So you should have not negligible amounts or not present at all uh, in, the, in, in the body in morning hours. And having that is crucial in getting you a peak at nighttime. So your body realizes, wait a minute, it's peaking up, I should go to sleep. And, um, that, and the, the uh, tablet computers, et cetera, disrupt that cycle. So you're 
you do tremendous research on glaucoma and I want to have you come back so we could talk about cutting edge research on glaucoma. But if we could just talk just about a couple of things about these glasses that you're working on that are actually going to be able to look at the blood vessels in the conjunctiva of the eye, the lining over the white part that will look at the dilation and constriction to measure intraocular pressure. Uh, tell us about that. Oh, thank you for that question. So this uh, work is um, with uh, my associates and friends in California Baptist University, Dr. Matthew Ricard and uh, jo uh, Joshua Park. These are engineers. They have uh, developed uh, a cool, very cool finding. So we wear glasses, we wear sunglasses or some form of glasses. And uh, they are engineers and they think very much outside the box when it comes to this. So can you take a picture of the eye and actually know the eye pressure. Now, cameras have become really small, and so they have fitted this eyeglasses with cameras with batteries in the temple that can actually record the data. And what they are seeing is, if you think of the eyeball like a balloon, if your pressure increases, the balloon's going to stretch. And so the blood vessels that are on the surface of the eyeball are going to be changing its position. And so a high definition camera can actually record that and translate into pressure values. And we think that this is going to revolutionize some of the wearable technology. It's gonna be cool to wear glasses again, rather than actually not wear them and get, and this is just a tip of the iceberg. If you extrapolate or think about this, you can get so much more data from taking a picture of an eye and uh, I think this is going to revolutionize some of the eye care that we're, uh, that we're dealing with. And you're working on something with contact lenses and a camera as well. If you could explain right. that. So the, that research is being done in my laboratory. Um, we are trying to uh, do the baseline or the early trials on this contact lens system. So contact lenses patients can wear. Uh, we all wear it for our glasses, refractive error. Can these contact lenses measure pressure? Now, this is not a new idea. The idea that's fundamentally new is Smart, Le Smart Lens, which is a Northern California-based company, and they hold the patent for this. Uh, without any electronics embedded in the contact lens, what they do is they can actually uh, have uh, multiple layers of contact lens that may change its shape or, and fluid in the contact lens um, on the basis of increased pressure. So the pressure increases, there's a chamber with fluid that's going to increase just like a, a, a gauge. And a person can take, a, take their smartphone out, take a picture of their eye, take a smartphone, take a picture, and they'll be reading the pressure values. So these would actually help the doctor a lot because then the patient can tell them, uh, or this data can actually tell how your, how your eyeball or your eye pressure is behaving throughout the day. We usually are lucky to have one pressure reading once every three months if the patient comes to the clinic. We have no idea what pressure is doing during the day on a regular basis. And technology like that we just mentioned would probably uh, help the process and doctors a lot and will probably help take care of glaucoma better. Like continuous glucose monitor, but would be, but would be for, uh, for a glaucoma, which is really amazing. Now, yes, right. The last question I have to ask you is about diabetes and just to go back with the uh, carotenoids because we skipped over diabetes. So you have some information on that to share. Yes, so uh, a diabetic eye has a greater amount of um, oxidative damage and this also depletes the level of carotenoid. There is a good few uh, articles that has looked at this issue very carefully uh, there are studies that show that individuals that have greater amount of carotenoids in their eye are better protected against diabetic eye disease. So the diabetes and the diabetic eye disease depletes the carotenoids in your eye by either taking them in your diet or supplementing via, um, via uh, nutritional supplements. One can actually change the course of, diabetes, of diabetic eye disease and enhance your vision uh, and the outcome in, um, in a patient. 
So in summary, we've talked a lot about carotenoids and their protective effects, and it's very broad. Just give us a summary of where, again, where we could get those carotenoids, what foods contain them, and about supplements. Everything, everything starts with good diet. Make sure, just like uh, Kerry said, you know, have a rainbow uh, or diet with, both, with actually fruits and uh, vegetables of various color. That's a starting point. Look for um, the levels of carotenoids. So kale, for example, has a large amount of lutein. Um, they need to be cooked a little bit to actually release the carotenoids. Green leafy vegetables are good. Corn, um, or orange, yellow, be or bell peppers or peppers get, gives you a lot of carotenoids as well. And uh, what we don't get in our diet, we will have to try and supplement. And that's why they are called a supplement to our diet. You cannot undo a bad diet with, by, by popping a pill. So it starts fundamentally with good diet, and then you add supplement to your diet. I want to thank the professor, Dr. DeVay, for joining me today. If somebody wants to find out more about your work, how can they do that? Um, most of us have websites. So my website at Western University of Health Sciences has various details of mine. Um, and uh, Google has done a fine job of revealing everybody's everything. So you'll, you'll, you'll find me. Well, thank you, Dr. DeVay, Professor DeVay, for joining me today. You're a world of information. I can't wait to have you come back and we'll talk about what's new in glaucoma. For Open Your Eyes, this is Dr. Kerry Gill. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I like to bring extra, and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.